Welcome everyone. Thank you all for joining us today. If you would go ahead in the chat, um, tell us which department you're in and how long you've been at the College of Charleston. Today, we're going to be exploring session two of teaching and learning and ongoing pandemic conditions. Um, and Dr. Ian O'Byrne, Associate Professor of Literacy and Teacher Education in the School of Education, Health and Human Performance, um, is gonna talk to us about strategies to help students digest content efficiently and honestly, um, and read course materials strategically for better course outcomes. So Ian, you are up. Awesome, thank you very much. Uh, it's good to see you all. Hopefully you're all doing well. Um, you are appreciated. I have a couple links that I'm gonna share. Um, so I put all of my materials together. I'm gonna put a blog post there in the chat. Um, those of you that know me uh, realize I have a blogging problem. Um, I also have a, the slide deck here for you to peruse. Um, so I will put this in as well. Um, the blog post basically shares, uh, it's an opportunity for me to write my ideas out and get sort of my ideas in order um, and share some of this uh, with, with others out there. Um, it's also, a, I feel like blogging is a good way for me to have a little bit of peer review and see if what I'm saying actually makes sense. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. Let me see if I can get all this going on at the same time. So I'll do screen one. Um, you all able to see my screen? All right. So the first thing I shared was this blog post. Um, and so it basically details pretty much everything that I'm going to talk about. Um, I also include one of the things that I challenged myself to do today was I challenged myself to, um, yes, Margaret, I'll share it. Um, this is a teaching moment. So now I will go to uh, change to anyone with the link and let's make you all commenters. And then you should be able to see it and comment on it. Um, so uh, I shared a lot of the, the ideas and the research here in this blog post. One of the things I challenged myself to do as well is figure out how to add citations. Um, so I was pretty excited about that today. Um, uh, but basically all the materials that we'll talk about are there because this should be an ongoing dialogue. Um, and then here is the slide deck uh, for our time today. Uh, so I'll go ahead and hit present uh, so we can go full screen. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about developing a culture of inquiry and thinking about supporting our students as they read, as they connect uh, in our classes, as they comprehend information. We want to think about uh, motivation. We want to think about um, how we support students as they try to get organized in our classes and interact with our content areas. Um, and so, as I said before, I am social. Uh, I blog a bit too much about things that I am interested in. Um, I also have a weekly newsletter, which I joke is my weekly love letter to the internet, where I try to make sense of what's happening out there in the world of technology and identify what this means for all of us. Um, and as I indicated before, all of the materials for this session are already available online so you can take a peek at it. Uh, to begin, I start off a lot, I start off most of my classes with a tweetable summary, an essential question to keep us focused. Um, and I do the same in, in addresses and keynotes. And so, what I'm gonna talk about today is the opportunity to develop a culture of inquiry and think about how motivation, uh, unpreparedness on the part of our students, uh, valuing the time and resources of our students, um, and how do we negotiate all of those components so that we can help our students as they move from just learning how to read to reading how to learn. Um, and then as I was thinking about this talk, I was really motivated. I was moved by this quote by C.S. Lewis, um, thinking about not just reading and not just literacy practices, but more about community and more about thinking how we provide space for learners as they interact in our classes um, and become a part of our community at CFC, but also more importantly, become a part of um, our different fields and our areas of interest. Um, as I begin, I want to 
Uh, thank you for being here. I recognize the fact that you're all dealing with a lot in your lives, both personally and professionally. Uh, you are appreciated. I know that we've all been through a lot together over the last two, three, six years. Um, with COVID. So you are appreciated. I'm thankful for you. As part of that, I wanted to begin with a vibe check. I was inspired by uh, last week's discussion. So please in the chat, go ahead and, and give us two words to let us know how you're feeling today. How are you doing on this Wednesday? It's 60 degrees outside, at least here in the, the Charleston area. How are you doing today? And you can obviously unmute. We have a, a nice uh, size group so that you know, more of you, less of me is a good thing. How are you doing today? Hopeful and encouraged. Thank you, Jen. Connected and fulfilled, hopeful, good, hungry, <laughs> cautiously optimistic. It's a very tenuous statement there, Dr. White. Um, so I, I use a... Uh, vibe check in my classes. It really helped me a lot last uh, it, when I was, for the most part, virtual. Um, and I still do it in my classes uh, to this day because I want to just make sure that my students are all right. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about sharing what you love. We're going to try and dig into the research and think about why students may not be reading. And I'm going to say may um, in this because I think that um, I, for this presentation, I looked at what the research suggests. And I want to hear from all of you to, to see what you are seeing. Um, but then also, quite honestly, um, I would go back to my students and ask them <laughs> whether they're reading or not. And if not, why are they not reading? Um, I feel like it's it that but that that's the, the type of trust that I try to have in my classroom so that we can have these discussions. And if they're not reading, they'll just tell me um, that they're not reading. We'll try to get to the root of why. Um, and then also, most importantly, what do we do about this? How do we make this happen? Um, so I think that this all should begin with um, you. Uh, can you put in the chat or can you unmute and let me know why you love your field, why you love your discipline. If you're a literacy educator and researcher, why? Why do you love that? If you are in foreign language, if you're in communications, if you were, why do you love your field? Why do you love your discipline? Why do you love your job, I'll say? I love study abroad. Sarah, why do you love study abroad? Because I think it, sorry, and sorry, I don't have my camera on because my um, it doesn't work with with my setup here. But anyway, no worries um, at all. I love study abroad because that is the best way to connect with students. I think you meet them outside of the classroom, and you get to see them grow when they're abroad. So I really enjoy that a lot. Awesome, Jen. Can you say more about neuroscience, please? Yeah, so one of the things I love about neuroscience I get to talk about every day in my classes is that what I'm telling my students is something that we know now and there are so many things that may be wrong with what I'm telling them that we could that they may be the people who get to figure out what the correct answer is or get us closer to whatever the truth is and I just love that excitement of living on the edge of what's known and not known and being able to invite the students there with me to that place. And I, I was actually talking about neuroscience this week in my language and lit class. Um, and it's, and just from my perspective outside of the field, um, just as an ed psychologist, it is amazing all of the stuff that we're constantly finding out pretty much on a daily basis. And in my lectures about like this small part of, of language development and cognition has to always change and stay up to date with what's happening out there. Yeah, the change is always fun. Absolutely. Kelly, can you tell us more about connection and growth? So I'm an early childhood educator by trade. Um, and so I love uh, working with young children for that reason, because it's focused on growth and, and progress and them connecting ideas, but also connecting with one another. Um, but I also like that in regards to teacher education, there's always something new to be learned and um, collaboration is key too, so especially at that age group. Yeah. There's, there's so, there's such magical little human beings. Um, Marsha, uh, how important is financial literacy? 
critical, critical to keeping students um, within their budget and not being stressed with tons and tons of debt when they leave college. Should we do a better job, either as students are leaving high school or coming into to college, should we do a better job building financial literacy? Yes. We need, I think, I honestly believe that every student should have to take the financial literacy class that we offer here. I think it's Finance 120 as a freshman. It's one of those that should challenges. Be a general education requirement. Absolutely. Absolutely. Debbie, tell us a little bit about working with adults, <clears throat> thinking about fulfillment. Oh, so I've been teaching for over 30 years now, which puts a lot of age on me, doesn't it? <laughs> so, and of course at TLT, I get to work with adult learners too, because sometimes it's, you know, technology and TLT, but um, I teach also in the professional studies program. And before that I was in mostly continuing ed. So they come in with such amazing experience, which I get to draw upon as I teach and um, seeing them sort of recognize new things, even as older um, adults is uh, just incredibly uh, rewarding. I think. Absolutely. Um, and so the reason I begin with this is uh, one of the classes that I've taught for uh, many years is a continuity reading writing class and I always struggle with this because I try to embed reading and writing and literacy practices into my middle grades or secondary social studies teachers classroom or a math class and I've always struggled with it and then one of my colleagues uh, one day said you know if you begin with where you love if you begin with talking to students about why they love math why they love uh, science then really, then literacy practice has become a, a discussion about how do you share and express that love for your field or your discipline with your students. So we're basically pr providing that approach point. Um, and so I think about this discussion as, as, a, uh, as, as thinking about how do we share this with, with our students? How do we share your love of your field or your excitement in your area with your students? Yes, this also includes the practices, the skills, the habits of mind, the dispositions in your area of study. Um, there are uh, certain ways that a, a neuroscientist would think and write and share and examine the world that is totally different from uh, what I do in my classroom as a liter literacy educator and researcher. But if we begin by understanding where we come from and, and what we value and love about our fields, I think that we can, um, invigorate, excite our students. So I'm gonna take a look at the, the research that is out there. Once again, for those of you that are joining us late, I shared a all of the materials for this talk are out on a blog post. I'll put this in the chat again. Um, and the reason why that's important is because I don't want you to trust my words just because they're coming out of my mouth. Um, at any point you can go in and I link to the uh, to the pubs so that you can take a look for yourself. Um, and so a lot of the research suggests the following. Um, and at any point, please feel free to interrupt me, um, throw something in the chat. Um, this, you know, more of you, less of me is a good thing. Um, some of the research suggests that our students just generally are unprepared for classes. Um, and it's not any other motivating factor. It's basically just a general unpreparedness um, some of the research suggests that our students uh, think that we're just going to talk about it in class anyway, so there's really no need to read, uh, that we're just going to go through it um, when they get there. I can see being a former middle school English teacher, a former high school English teacher, I understand that. I recognize the fact that there's times that if I did not go through the materials, then students would never engage with it. I don't know what we do about that as, as educators in higher ed. Um, I'm interested to see what your thoughts are. Um, a lot of the research suggests that our students are just bored. They're not motivated by the readings um, and they perhaps do not take time to concentrate on longer texts. Um, I think that there is this narrative that exists in our spaces um, that we sort of unpack that. Uh, and we've already talked a little bit about that in our different discussions. Um, 
there's also the research suggests that for the most part, our students are skimming and scanning online. Um, some of my area of research, some of my background is in online reading comprehension. And so one of the things that we identified a little over a decade ago as I was a grad student is we would go to teacher ed conferences, we'd go to literacy conferences, and we would state that, you know, good online readers uh, skim and scan and good online readers don't get bogged down in text. Um, now that I am a decade or more beyond that research, I can suggest humbly that we probably missed the boat on that, um, that I think that there is a need for readers online to skim and scan, um, but we should have, we should have uh, crafted that statement a little bit better to think more about critical evaluation um, and some of the deeper reading processes that are needed that are necessary um, and and perhaps holding our epistemological stance at a distance as we read. Uh, the research also suggests that students generally don't uh, understand how they read best um, and then how to negotiate those texts. So we live in an incredible time to be a literate individual. Um, so I have a six-year-old at home um, that believes that she is going on 18, and I have a 11-year-old that's in middle school. And the way that they consume information um, is they, uh, many times they will begin with the initial text. So I bring my kids to the library every two weeks. They've had library cards since they were uh, legally allowed to have a library card here in the state. We go to the library, we take out books, we check out books. Um, I try and make sure this, that my kids don't lose the books um, so they can begin with that book. But then this past year, we, uh, I started them off on Kindles. Um, for the middle school student, it was a big help. Um, and then our daughter, because she saw her brother using it, she wants that as well. So now they can move from a book, they can move to the Kindle. Um, we also consume a lot of audiobooks and audio podcasts in our house, and we also consume a lot of uh, YouTube content. So my children and my kids are not normal by any stretch of the imagination, but my kids are pretty well adjusted when it comes to being able to move from, okay, how am I going to learn this content the best? Do I want to read it out of a book? Do I want to see it on a Kindle, on an e-version? Do I want to go to an audio podcast? Um, do I want to go watch a YouTube video about this? Do I want a fuller movie about this? Um, and a lot of the technology will support that as well. Um, so uh, Amazon has this, this function um, called WhisperSync. So you can be reading along on your Kindle and then you can basically stop there and then switch over to the audio version and Audible will pick up. Um, and so it's incredible to think about how we can think about these different texts in different spaces and which one suits us the best as we read. Um, I see that in my own practices. I consume a lot of audiobooks, a lot of podcasts. Um, there are certain pieces that I can't listen to the audio version of because I can't fully understand it. And I'm interested to hear from a neuroscientist about why that may be. Um, we also... Um, our students may not know how to organize their readings and think about how that connects to the structure of the text and the structure of academic pieces and scholar, scholarly pieces and how those pieces relate to other content in the field. Um, so more of a structure, like a, a meta-disciplinary look at why students may not be reading. Um, one of the other pieces that I've seen a lot in my classes, I've been testing out an ungrading system. And one of the things I've noticed is that uh, students are struggling with juggling multiple deadlines for multiple classes, and they're making decisions about what's more important to do and what's uh, a little bit less important. And so they're, they're indicating, okay, well, I need this done, and this professor is going to be on my case, so you're not giving me credit for my reading, or you're not giving me credit or lower credit for this assignment, so I'm not going to get that done. Um, so we have to think about time management, um, but we also, I think, need to spend a lot of time thinking about what we had uh, in our discussion last week is how much time and space and emotional energy our students have on a daily basis. Um, 
our students may or may not be multitasking while reading. That includes zombie scrolling, social media, listening to music, texting friends, gaming, binging content, all of the other stuff. Um, students might have difficulty understanding the discourse of our systems. They might have uh, difficulty understanding words like discourse <laughs> and trying to make sense of what they're reading and why they're reading and, and what these different components mean. Um, and so, um, wrong slide. Um, so what are your thoughts? Do you think students are reading in your classes? What are your current pain points? And then uh, what are your thoughts in terms of the research about why you think students may not be reading? What do you think? Feel free to put it in the chat, unmute. We're all friends here. I think the students in my classes, finance is pretty dry with the textbook. So I am using the McGraw-Hill text with the connect assignments that go with it. And the reading assignments can be done um, through a process called SmartBook. Mm -hmm. And the students can read the important parts of the book while completing the little feedback questions that they're asked. And I know they're not going to read the textbook, but if I can get them to do that, and I've got it um, a high weight on that for the grade, I find that the students more often will do that and complete those assignments and at least they're reading part of it. And then this semester I started giving them, I'm doing a sustainability related course and they are assigned um, weekly papers that they have to read and basically it's Bloomberg Green newsletter so it's a one page short newsletter and they have to give me feedback about one of the day's newsletters every week so they're at least reading that and I find that they are now reading more of the articles that I'm posting for them from other sources, which makes me happy. I love the focus on voice and choice in, in selections for the readings. Um, I do that in my technology class. It works you know, to varying degrees of success, um, basically giving a number of resources and trying to, to suggest to students, okay, you figure out what sticks with you and then come back and let's talk about it. Other voices. Do you think students are reading in your classroom? Do you have a pain point here? And then if so, what are your thoughts about the, the research that I shared? Hey, Ann. Um, hey there. I wanna talk a little bit about kind of, um, when I talk with students about FYA courses and, and kind of when they're, um, things that they typically shy away from <laughs> are courses that involve a lot of reading or writing. Um, and it's a little intimidating for them. And so I think hearing that is sometimes an intro trepidation thing for students. Um, that's why I, while I'm not teaching in these courses, I think that can sometimes be a factor that students are just hesitant to even do them in that, in that kind of circumstance. I agree. I think it's one of those, um, and once again, this is something I was talking about in my classes this week. Um, you know, thinking about like Bronfenbrenner's like ecological theory and how I view myself in relation to the, the work that I'm doing and other systems around me. You know, I am a, a literacy educator. We're talking about reading and writing. Um, you know, some of my students would not have a problem indicating that they might struggle with math, but a lot of times there's that fear of, you know, they, they don't want to say I'm a striving reader, I'm a struggling reader, I'm a, I have challenges with writing. Um, and I indicate that, you know, I struggle with writing at times, I struggle, you know, with, with, with drilling down and doing closer reading. Um, what are some ways that you address that in the FYE program? What are some ways that other people address it as you start classes, if you know, you're going to talk, if you know, the, the reading or the writing requirements are, I'm not going to say hi, but, you know, normal. So I will say, Ian, another thing that I see is um, students think that reading should be one way. 
and they think that you assign material and you've got 70 pages to read over the week and they think that you're supposed to start on page one and finish on page 70 and and they think if they haven't done it that way then they're not prepared yeah and so <clears throat> a lot of it for me is um it's teaching them a you don't have to read like that in college and and nobody expects you to read like that and and then b that space of how can you get this information in a lot of different ways and then c walking them through it and showing them how to break down whether it's a research article that they have to read or it's a a chapter from a book that they have to read and showing them like what the objectives are or why why did the publishers use a bunch of pictures um, in this chapter so and how can you get the information by re reading the pictures right or the visuals or the infograms um, infographics rather than reading all of the words and or or reading the summary at the end of the chapter before you actually go and you read the the highlights students don't know this and they literally come in and they're exhausted because they think that they were supposed to read all 70 pages in order to come to class honestly i think that is i love the 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 statement about reading be a reading as a one-way process um i think that you know, there's different ways, there's different types of reading. Um, there are times that you do need to skim and scan and try and figure out what you can pick up. Um, but then I think a lot of, you know, a, a lot of our students come in with one conception about reading that is baked in through what they've had in K-12. Other thoughts about whether or not your students are reading and then if, if you find this to be a pain point, what, what do you think the root of it is? I'm aligned with everyone else as far as, you know, just lacking concentration. We're just kind of as a society, it's it's short term content over long term content. And that's become a, a good struggle. I'm in marketing. So, mm -hmm. you know, that's that's a good challenge, um, you know, certainly due to exhausted individuals and not all of it's just school related, you know, so just trying to learn and figure out how to move past it. I thought it was interesting, Marsha, you mentioned how they were leaning in on some of the other types of content and actually willing to read some of those over the textbook. Textbooks can be dry, McGraw-Hill mainly, you know, I definitely have that struggle on one of them as well. I have noticed, though, I've started picking apart at little bits of pieces you know, to your point, telling them these are the pages I want you to read. And then I also want you to go read this article. And I also want you to read this video because that 10 minute attention span that we have, we have to deal with in class, just to, it, it explodes when they're outside of class. So if I can get them to, you know, engage with different types of content, I feel like it's starting to work. One of my pain points to your point, I noticed I had a module um, that had two chapters and I needed them to read it in, in the week. And I've started using using perusal so I can actually tell when they stop reading. And so they got through the first chapter, but barely anyone read the second chapter. And I was like, okay, lesson learned. I cannot do that. It's just, it's too much. Even when I'm forcing them to read and I'm monitoring it and they're getting graded on it, there's just no way. It's too much for them in one week. Yeah, it's, um, there's a, a uh, a research piece that I've linked somewhere in my blog that suggested that even a lot of the video that we share with our students, you know, YouTube clips, they're only watching the first 30 seconds, you know, minute and then timing out. Um, and we've also, you know, my, my area of research, I, I study literacy practices online um, and hybrid engagement. Um, with individuals. And one of the things that's interesting is that a lot of our social networks, a lot of our social media you know, now we're starting to realize that it's just a poor design feature, you know, and so now you see, because the, the user cannot adapt to the interface, now you're seeing sources like Twitter, Twitter will say, like, if you try to retweet something without actually clicking on the link and reading it, Twitter is basically trying to, you know, educate the user and say, maybe you want to read this first, before you just share it out with others. Um, but I think that there is this mindset about, you know, we, we spent a lot of time thinking about what reading or, or literacy practice could be and not as much about what it should be. Um, 
one of the pieces that Jen put in the chat and she also messaged that she had to leave is uh, OER or open ed resources. Um, I am in love with OER as evidenced by the fact that I'm sharing this talk out on my blog, um, but I feel like more information out there, more high quality information, not that my blog posts are high quality, but more good information out there is better for the planet. Um, the challenge in that is we don't spend enough time thinking about what we could and should do with these texts that are out there. So OER is basically this belief um, uh, that if we have these resources that are out there that are out there so that students don't have to pay for them, then we're we're reducing the the barrier, one of the barriers to entry and that students are going to be more willing to read if they don't have to pay for the book. Um, yes and no. Uh, a lot of the, the early research suggests that even if they're not paying for the materials, that they're not engaging in reading more deeply. Um, and it's for some of the reasons that were indicated in the earlier slides. Um, any other people want to unmute and talk about how you feel at this point? So let's talk about what we do about this. Um, and once again, I started by talking about focusing on what you love, why you love your discipline, why you love your content area, um, and trying to make that accessible and approachable for students. Um, I also suggested at the beginning that this is why our students may not be reading and, and heavy emphasis on the may component. Um, I recognize that some of my students are not reading as deeply as I would like, um, and I try a lot of different tools. Uh, my FYE, we listen to our main text for the class is a podcast. It's a podcast about Kendrick Lamar and To Pimp a Butterfly, and even that, a lot of the students are not listening to it. Um, and so, you know, I would want to talk to students and ask them, are they reading or not? So a lot of the research suggests that these are some ways that we could um, make this happen in our classrooms. Um, I begin by talking about uh, talking about a culture of inquiry. Um, this is uh, one of the ways that I frame that blog post, but then also I think about uh, uh, literacy practices in my classroom. Um, a lot of this is framed by McTy and Wiggins um, and thinking about um, creating a space for students where we open up doors for understanding. So if we approach this from a, a viewpoint of uh, why we love our content area, why we love our field, why are we super jazzed about uh, our discipline, then how do we make this more approachable for students? And so we're talking about having a climate of trust, um, a, a, a space in our classroom, a space in our learning environments where students understand the need for questions, understand the need for identifying answers or at least chasing answers, and they're involved in the inquiry process with us. Um, and so that's going to help address a little bit the motivation. It's going to help address um, you know, ways to create those bonds and connections with students um, this, uh, this idea, this mindset has a lot of different, uh, you know, names, uh, in a lot of our classes in teacher ed, we'll call it project-based learning. Um, but there's other ways that this authentic, effective, uh, teaching and learning and assessment would look, but it's basically all framed around a culture of inquiry. Um, so one of the first things that the research suggests is that we be intentional about the value of the readings. Um, and what this means is, uh, this is something that we frequently talk about in the distance ed course, um, and we've talked about in TLTCon and elsewhere, is that a lot of our students don't read the syllabus. Surprise, surprise. Um, and so one of the questions, uh, one of the points that was brought up in the research is that there is the need to be more intentional in our classes the first days to talk about what are the readings for the class? Why do we read? What are the materials that we expect our students to, um, uh, to consume? And why do we want them to do it? Um, so why do we have them engage with these readings? And how does that connect to uh, work process, work product, grades, value in the class? And how does it uh, uh, connect with the field? So 
Um, I know that my classes, when I go through the syllabus uh, the first day of class, for the most part, I spend most of my time talking to students about who they are and try to create that, that welcoming culture in my room. But the research is suggesting that that might be problematic because I need to get down to the nuts and bolts of the class and talk about uh, the rules and the readings and why they are valued. Um, the research also suggests that there is the need to have quick assessments and assessment is really not the right word for this, but basically have quick surveys of students to try and identify gaps in their knowledge, um, things that they may not understand. Um, this is um, a lot of our students don't may not recognize the fact that they do have gaps in learning um, or gaps in background knowledge. And so there is the need to have quick assessments to try and make sense of, OK, what do you know? What do you need to know? Um, are there any areas of this um, of this that you don't understand? And once again, Assessments is really not the right term for this. Um, in, the, in the research, this is more of a, a quick formative assessment. This might be a, a simple survey for no points uh, as students begin class to try and identify what are some areas that you know or don't know or need to know as we read. Um, the background of this screen, as I indicated before, I'm, I'm utilizing an ungrading system in my classes now. And so this is I every week for their reading assignments, I have a simple five or six point quiz where I ask them if they read the materials I gave them for the week and then what sort of feedback or questions that they have based upon what they consumed that week. Um, so one of the, the, the other pieces of research indicates that there is a need to ask students if they are having challenges with the readings in order to identify points that might make uh, that might uh, cause them to struggle. Um, I'm a big fan of reading logs and blogging, obviously, but a fan of reading logs to monitor comprehensions and comprehension and have students document learning. Um, so reading comprehension is a challenging process. Um, it's difficult even for all of us. Um, I, I'll speak for myself. It's difficult for me to read a dense text and immediately understand it and move on. Um, so there are times that I need to push pause on learning and think about what I just read. Um, and so a reading log is going to give us that opportunity to have students sort of document what they've learned, where they've learned it, um, and pay attention to the text and try to parse that out to make sense of it. One of my favorite tools, um, and, and many of you have heard me say this before, uh, to, to, do, uh, to engage in this process is hypothesis. So in a lot of my classes, I use hypothesis to uh, have students, we, we had dialogue, we have discussion about the text baked into the text. Um, and I can very easily jump in and show a little uh, overview of how I use hypothesis. This is a screenshot of what hypothesis would look like. It's an open source annotation tool. So this is a, a PDF that I would share in my classes. And then I share that research PDF with students um, and Hypothesis is the browser plugin, and my students can go in and highlight a piece of text and leave a comment about what they thought. The real power uh, comes in two ways. One way is that students can see and respond to other students' comments, but then what I also like is I can very quickly <laughs> go in and see which students have actually been engaging with the text, uh, because I can see their name and see that they've had zero, three, or 10 comments on the text. Um, not that that is a telltale sign of how deep they're reading, but at least I know if they're actually uh, interacting with the text. The other thing I would, uh, that the research suggested is that there's a need to have an expanded view of text, an expanded view of what counts in our course materials. Um, we talked about this a little bit already today. Um, there is the opportunity to have websites, there is the opportunity to have OER, uh, videos, animations, memes, podcasts, audio clips, um, but expand the, 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 the teaching materials that we have in our classroom. Um, 
some of the value in that is that we can share the same topic or the same information that they would get in their in their textbook in the reading materials present it from but present it from a different point of view um, so the use of newsletters the use of other online materials to supplement support or perhaps show a different perspective on what they're reading in class uh, helps a lot of our students out also very important to have students do something as they read um, our students uh, human beings are active learners we learn through knowledge construction um, once again, to talk about my language and lit class this week, uh, one of the things we're talking about is that our brains are not sponges. We don't learn, you are all gaining nothing uh, by words coming into your ears and then soaking into your brain and moving on. We need to do something with that. Um, so one of the things I use in some of my classes is Flipgrid. Um, so I will ask students to go in and read a selection and then uh, go give a, a quick talk about what they learned or a point that they had or a question they had about the reading. Um, there is another process called a three minute thesis Carnegie Mellon uses. Um, so I uh, will set up Flipgrid so that students basically have three minutes, no more, no less to give their take on what they read for the week and have a little bit of discussion and dialogue before they come to class so that we can save that time in class for more meaningful uh, practices. Other things to think about for active knowledge construction, um, and all of these resources are on the blog post because I was getting excited reading about this and preparing the materials, so I, I can assume that this would be valuable to you all. Um, simple things like have students rephrase, synthesize, evaluate, prioritize ideas in the readings. Um, super simple process, but have students restate what they're reading in their own words. Um, very valuable um, to, to basically explain it from their point of view. Uh, I use a lot of mind mapping software in my classes. Coggle is a tool that you can use and it plug, it's an online tool. It's a, uh, a mind mapping tool. So instead of a linear Google doc or a linear Word doc, they can think more spatially and see how things connect. Um, so in some of my classes, if we're piecing out an air, areas of the field over the class, I might have them have a Google, uh, a Coggle document that they space out throughout the semester, what they're learning and find interconnections. You know, they identify interconnections throughout the semester. Um, have students serve as discussion directors. If you have a bigger class that can be unwieldy to read reading logs and assess reading logs, one of the things that I've used in the past is to have students serve as discussion directors. Um, I, you know, appoint two or three students per week and they monitor the online discussions or whatever's happening outside. And then when they come into class, that group would basically lead the class in discussion for the first five, 10 minutes, talk about what they learned, what they talked about, what are the salient points in the readings or the discussion or hypothesis, and they start the dialogue for the class. Um, uh, create a class wiki. Uh, in the past, we had this incredible tool called Wikispaces but I would use uh, a class wiki where students would identify and define and write content for the class. Uh, so in a previous life, I taught an ed psych class um, and there is uh, only so many ways that I can write where my students can write about Lev Vygotsky, even though Vygotsky is incredible. And so my students would create a class wiki where they would write about Lev Vygotsky or they would write about scaffolding and then now I have an online document, the website for the class that students write the content for, then in future semesters, when students come into that class and they want to learn about, you know, scaffolding or Lev Vygotsky, they go back and they use the materials that were written by previous students. Very powerful. Um, obviously, we have questions about um, FERPA. Debbie can talk to us about that. Uh, we have questions about um, whether or not you want students to edit the work of other students. That is a, a big pain point that a lot of my peers have had in the past. Um, also the opportunity for students to identify illustrations or memes or create an illustration about what they just learned. Um, so do a quick sketch about what you learned, um, identify a meme, identify an object online that basically shares what you learned or what you read and why you selected that. Um, there's a lot of research in visual analogies 
uh, to try and make sense of different ways to share what you've you've uh, comprehended. Um, I also love the opportunity to, as a class, map out content. So this is related to the the mind mapping software and Coggle and other tools. But um, is there the opportunity to, in your class, you as the instructor and students take time and just map out what you've learned and where you've learned it? Okay, so we can use whiteboards, we can use online tools, we can use chart paper. When this is done, we can take cell phone shots and we can upload those to some sort of online repository so we can keep track of this. Um, but it's a powerful experience where you as the guide, you as the content expert, you as the individual that loves your area, you can basically identify, okay, here's what we learned and where we learned it. And here's how these things connect with one another. Um, we don't often spend a lot of time uh, connecting those dots for students. So time in class using whatever tools we have um, at hand is a very powerful way, a powerful way to make those connections for students. Um, I also love reading strategies. Um, a reading strategy is a, a short, uh, easy way to have students think about content before, during, and after uh, reading, but this is really thinking about before, during, and after cognition. Um, I love think, pair, share activities. I love turn and talk. I love jigsaw. I love tea party uh, activities. Uh, these are the bread and butter of most of my teacher ed courses. I have links in the post to figure out how to do these, but a lot can be gained by just having a quick turn and talk with your students um, when they come in and say, okay, we read this today, turn to your neighbor and explain what you read and what was interesting to you. And then let's bring it back to the larger group. Um, very powerful way to make those connections because we learn by socializing. I also love questions, um, and this was highlighted in the research as well. Um, questions provide an opportunity for us to, yes, a tea party, Sarah. Um, so a tea party, um, one of the thing, if you Google it, a tea party has a elementary ed connotation. Um, there is also a higher ed version <laughs> called Chillin' with Scholars. Um, I will put the link in the chat right now. Um, but I think it's loosely, I think it's related to a jigsaw activity where you would have um, the tea party is where everyone has a little basis of information or they're an expert in an area and they sort of go around the room and share with one another their ideas. The, the key part here is the social part of knowledge construction and the social part of learning. Um, so a tea party um, is a good activity just to get students up out of their seats, walking around, talking to each other. If you want to have it be a cocktail party, that's fine, Deb. I'm not, a, I'm not opposed to that at all. Um, we're not recording this, are we? I'm just kidding. Um, I also, uh, as I indicated, I love questions. Um, I think that questions provide an opportunity for us to think more deeply about what's happening in our classroom. Um, what this can be is you can... As the instructor, uh, let's say you're meeting Wednesdays from three o'clock to five o'clock, about noon or one o'clock on Wednesday, you can send out a post on Oaks or Teams, uh, basically indicating, okay, this week, these were your readings. Today in class, I'm going to talk about these two or three questions or these simple prompts and give a little bit of time for students to activate prior knowledge and think and perhaps prepare or Google, uh, but at least come into class a little bit more prepared. Another variant of this, which can be very powerful, is have your students identify questions that they have from the reading and share those questions out with you. This can be an opportunity for you to use that as a classroom instructor uh, to guide instruction. You can use it to have one-on-one -on -one discussions with classes. Um, this is important because it makes students feel valued. It makes students feel like that you're listening and paying attention to them and that they're a part of the process. Um, so a couple last components, uh, a lot of words came out of my mouth, but I wanted to uh, highlight some of the things that I see and then also uh, have a little bit of time just for chat. Um, one of the things that's, that's uh, evident to us, um, and this was brought up last week, 
is students want to collaborate. Um, students want to collaborate, they want to listen, they want to learn. Um, last week's session, um, one of the points was brought up that, that this generation uh, spends a lot of time coming to adults to try and figure things out. And so they want to collaborate, they want to listen, they want to learn, to, uh, learn from us, they want to listen and learn to their peers. Um, we know that our students are uh, struggling with motivation and staying organized. Your students in your classes are probably very different than the students that we have in teacher ed. My students are tapped out. My students are emotionally exhausted. Um, they are struggling uh, making that, that, that transition back to face-to-face -to -face learning. There's a lot of questions in the air. Um, and so they have a lot of concerns. So motivation and organization and focus is problematic. I, I feel, and it's not just my students, I feel the same way. I feel there's times that I feel like I'm struggling just staying motivated and organized. Um, please keep in mind that the CSL is a, an invaluable uh, piece of the puzzle here at CFC. I think that um, uh, I, I know that our students um, value the CSL. I give, I'm one of those, those instructors that uh, stalks my students to see if they go to the CSL and give them extra credit if they go, because I think it's invaluable. Um, it was brought up last week that we spend a lot of time thinking about students using the CSL as they begin at CFC, but then I have juniors and seniors, they need the CSL more than any that, than ever before. Um, so I think that this is a, a, an area that we should um, use more of. And I want to close by saying that you're not alone. I really value these sessions that Margaret and Seidel are running um, to highlight the, the challenges and the struggle and the inquiry that we're all engaged in. Um, I think that we are better together. I think that we can learn a lot from each other. And I really value these discussions where we can have dialogue about what's working and not working, but at the end of the day, focus on what's important and that's our students and each other. Um, so with that being said, all the materials are out online. Um, the blog post is out there. The slide deck is out there. And I will be quiet. So what are your thoughts? I don't think that asking students to read is a lost cause. I recently heard a colleague say, you know, it's just a lost cause. And I often hear high school teachers say it's a lost cause, so I just have to do it or give it to, to, to students. I have now a college age student and a high schooler, and I value their input about um, how much reading they're given and how much value is put into it by the professor. And so students know, they know that if, if you're going to um, actually use the material in class and, and call on them to use the material in a supportive way, they're gonna do the work. They're gonna do the work because they're, they, they wanna be there. Um, and so it, I, I want to end on a super positive note that reading is not a lost cause. Granted, if people don't read, I don't have a job because that's what I do and I love literacy, but I'm, I, 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 um, I will die on my own sword knowing that um, it's not a lost cause. And, and I think that we're selling students short if we think that they, <clears throat> they don't want to read. It, I think some of it is the impetus is on us as faculty to make sure that their reading is valuable. Ian, thank you. Yeah, I agree. I think it's uh, not a with the thank you part, but I think that it's it's all about culture. You know, I, I think it's going back to my two little cherubs. Literacy and reading is a culture of our house. We read together. We we, you know, over the holiday break, I read and my son read Dune and then we watched Dune together. Like it's just it's a way for us to interact. We have dialogue about what we're reading. If we can bring that same culture to our classroom, we can get a lot to happen. Other voices, other questions, other concerns. 
I think some of it's expectation setting as well. You know, back to Margaret's comment, like if the expectation in day one is, you know, I'm, I'm meticulous. I try to figure out what works best in the classroom and I'm going to have you read the stuff that makes the most sense and you vow that to the students and then, but the expectation is that you actually do go through the material and identifying ways to have them engage in the material in unique ways. That seems to be working a bit more. I have to shake it up every once in a while, but um, you know, if I can get them to to ask questions, like you said, and I can get them to actually reflect on it and how it connects to their own lives, it makes a big difference. So I was um, asked to take a capstone course, which I love the book that I was using, but it's huge. It has like 16 chapters. It's for my project management course. And I have two objectives, really. I want to get them prepared for the national PMP, PMI examination, which is probably one of the harder examinations. Most people fail it on their first try. But they've also gone through a series of five other courses. And I want to make sure that I have rounded out that education. So I use this comprehensive book. But they've now put it in an express class for me. So the reading has become so heavy for every week, two chapters, it's, it's just too much. So I took a strategy of, I'm gonna make a worksheet so that they can hunt for the things that I want them to get out of that, um, and, you know, that couple chapters for the week, the kind of the highlights, the high points, the things I know they're going to need to know for the big national exam. Um, what do you think about that a strategy? I asked the students and they thought it would be better than just reading the chapters and not having something. Oh, and the other thing they have to, they have to simulate a project. And I actually, instead of simulation, I actually let them use it in a real project in their life or work or whatever. So I asked them, instead of waiting to the last minute to do their project, I say, take the chapters because it would be how you would roll that out anyway, from very broad to very specific. So I have them reading, responding to the worksheets and then applying it to their project, hoping that that'll help make it all stick and make sense a little bit more. But it's still a lot. They they're just like it's heavy, and I don't know how else to make it better while still trying to get this in in six weeks. So um, without having to also make them read from page one to like you said, you know, seventy, and you know, anyway, any other ideas might be, you know, and there's there my students are typically balancing work and children and um, a bunch of other classes because and express classes at that, so we all truncate it. So. I don't know. Anyway, it's a challenge, <laughs> mostly in that class. The other classes aren't quite as heavy in the reading material, but that one especially. Or do I just find a new book that I can fall in love with too? <laughs> I don't know. I think that I see Dr. White is unmuting, so I will be quiet. <laughs> No, I was thinking through a similar strategy. So I have my students do reading logs and I was thinking that I need to do a better job in the class before the next class. So before they've read that chapter, kind of forecasting what's to come and what I hope they're getting out of that reading. And I was thinking I needed to do that work, but I think I will do that work for the first few weeks, but then I'm going to start kind of releasing that responsibility to them. And so as you look through the chapter, like what are the three questions that you think you should be able to end answer by the end of this reading this chapter or this article or whatever it happens to be. So I think I'm going to try to be more intentional about that. And at first I was thinking it would be a lot of work on my part to come up with all of that in advance. But then what I realized is it would be more useful if I did release that responsibility to them, because then they would have a better understanding of how to do that work without me and other courses. The other key is, uh, Debbie, I think that you're doing exactly what you need to do. I think it's multiple assessment points. I think if we're trying to get at the same knowledge multiple ways, using multiple pathways, there, you know, learning is not a linear process. We all have different ways that we got to this seat in a Zoom room at College of Charleston. So everybody has their own little pathway. If you have multiple points that all lead to that same content, you can try and figure out if your students are learning and try and ensure that they're learning. So it might seem like a minimal, like a study guide or, a, or a, you know, a, a, you know, an an investigation as they interrogate the text. But then if you keep coming back to those points in it using different assessments and other materials, then ultimately students will get it. Yeah, maybe even doing a project check-in 
a weekly and letting it be collaborative so they can comment on each other's projects as far as it goes with like the reading and what they built on it. So that's a good idea. So it's checked in, not just with the worksheet, they're turning in based upon the materials and the questions I asked, but how they're applying it. Um, so I'll just end with Sarah to comment about a lot of this is once again, I'll, I'll wrap up by, by saying that this is all about you and your content and, and the value or love that you have for your content. This is, um, there are times that we need to teach things that we may not be super excited about teaching. Um, I know that from teaching Johnny Tremaine for years, no offense to Johnny Tremaine, um, but it wasn't the top, the highlight of my, my teaching career. Um, but if I was excited about it, my students were excited about it. So a lot of it is going in and you being excited about the materials, you having the rationale for why you're, you're engaging with that content, you love your field. If you're excited about it, then students will. Um, so thank you all for being here. You're appreciated. This is not the end of the dialogue. So feel free to stay in touch. Thank you, Ian, so much for sharing with us today about reading strategies. Um, next week's session, I hope that you all are seeing that because I don't see you all anymore. Y'all are gone. Do you all see that or do you all see my email? We can see your PowerPoint. Oh, wonderful. So next week's session, um, we're going to be looking at pandemic learners and how to help them um, organize with time and task management of small and, and large assignments. So um, what we know is that students um, have said that they're having a really hard time being organized and more students have gone <clears throat> to the Center for Student Learning for academic coaching and they have stayed there. They haven't just gone for a check-in, but they actually then say, I wanna be here for, for the whole semester. Um, and the Center for Student Learning is actually pretty overwhelmed by the number of students who are needing that sort of support. And we know that as pandemic learners, they're not getting that kind of, they didn't get that kind of support um, if they were in online learning uh, during their senior years of high school. So um, we hope to, <clears throat> that you'll be able to join us next week. Thank you all for coming today. <laughs>